Nothing beats the feel of buttery smooth frets. And this is one of the comments I've been getting over and over again. And you guys have requested numerous times that I show you how I go about doing a complete fret level to be able to get really buttery smooth frets. Essentially a gloss finish. Now it's not as hard as you might imagine, but it is time consuming. And I figured I would show you the process step by step in real time and give you all of the tips that you need to be able to do it yourself. It's a relatively long process. So if you don't like watching somebody doing a whole lot of sanding, this might not be the video for you. But if you're interested in learning how to do it for yourself on the cheap and achieve a professional result, then this is something that you don't want to miss. So without further ado, let's go to the workbench and I'll show you how I do a fret level and polish. All right, guys. Well, today I'm going to be working on this Telecaster build. You probably have seen this one uh, as an ongoing series on my channel. This is the body that I painted from raw wood. I'm giving it uh, the classic butterscotch finish. This is going to be sort of replicating, a, you know, a 52 reissue Telecaster thin skin as you can see it's pretty thin you can actually see the the grain through it it's a very nice piece of wood um, and I think it's gonna be wonderful once I actually get some wear and tear on it it'll even age nicer this piece of wood is pretty heavy it's not a light body um, but it's gonna be a very nice guitar once it's done now I've gotten to the point where I finally received the neck that is going to be used on this build. Uh, as you can see, a very nice maple neck. This is a Mighty Might neck that I ordered, so it's actually licensed by Fender. It's got a, a gloss finish on it, both front and back, you can see. Uh, and today we're going to give it a fret level, because I noticed when I checked it that it is not actually 100% level and I thought I would show you the way I go about doing that. So I'm going to make a little bit of room here and we're going to be looking at doing a fret level A to Z. Now there's a couple of tools you will need to do this fret level and nothing crazy actually but the first thing I start off with to be able to make sure that everything is indeed level I have this straight edge. One side is notched out for a Gibson spacing, the other side is knocked out, uh, notched out for a Fender spacing. And basically what I do is I make sure by putting this on the neck, like so, that the neck is perfectly flat. If it's not flat, then we would have to actually flatten the neck before we actually start. And from what I can see, there's no gap underneath, the neck is pretty flat as is. So there's not, not there's nothing I need to do. If the neck had a curve in it, concave or convex curve, I would then adjust the truss rod here to make sure it's flat before I begin. So the next thing that I normally do is I take a fret rocker, which is this. It's basically a piece of metal that is ground perfectly flat on all sides. And I start rocking it along the fretboard. It doesn't really matter which direction you're doing this in. And I start off, you always want to be rocking between three frets. So I basically put that there and I see if I can actually rock the straight edge by, by doing this micro movement like that across the frets. And if there's no tilt, that's a good sign. It means the frets are level. And then I go down the frets three at a time until you spot some frets that are either high or low and you'll notice that because the rocker will do exactly that, will rock. Now you will see here um, that I actually marked up some frets, there's this one, this one, this one, this one, that are actually trouble spots. Um, and if you 
if I go where I actually marked, I did this ahead of time, uh, but if you go where I mark it, if you keep quiet, you might be able to hear that clicking sound. That indicates a high fret. So if you spot a high fret, what I do is I take a Sharpie and I mark where I'm getting the issue. See, this fret is right there. The rest of the fret is fine, but that section is no good. I'll move to the next one. And so on and so forth. Until I do all of the frets. So here's another one, which I already marked, but I'll mark again. And the reason why you mark the frets like that is because when you get to the leveling process, you want to make sure that all of these high spots are taken care of. And the marker will actually go away when you get there. Now the reason why the rocker has different lengths here is because when you get to a certain spot, the frets will be too close together to use the wide ones. So you'll move over to the narrower length. So right here we have another, another spot. And it's nothing crazy, but I'd like to start with a nice level fretboard before we do anything else. Okay, so you do this all the way through until you marked all the areas that are high. And like I said, I already did this previously, so I know more or less where they are. And once that's done, then you can move on to the next step, which is going to be protecting the fretboard. And normally what I do is I use some tape. It doesn't really matter what kind of tape you use. Mask, any kind of masking tape is fine. Um, but you gotta mask the fretboard. Some people like to use a little device, it's a little piece of thin metal to protect the frets. I found in my experience that that little device is good if you're leveling one fret, but if you have to do more than one, you're better off just masking the whole fretboard. That way you make sure that there's no chance of marring the finish. And here's a little tip that I can share with you. Before you start, put a length of tape all the way down the fretboard, um, the side of the fretboard, like this. Okay, and then the reason why I do this, I'll explain to you in a minute. There's logic to my madness. Okay, when I put the tape on the fretboard, I usually put a piece of tape on either side. You don't have to be really neat, you can just cut it with your fingers, or you could use a scissor but I wrap the, t the tape around. Because I put this here, when I wrap the tape around like this, it'll be much quicker for me to take everything off. I just peel this tape off and all the other ones will come along with it. Save some time because this is a time consuming process, guys, okay? A fret level takes time. That's why people that do this professionally charge quite a bit of money because you could easily spend you know, over an hour doing this, probably more depending on how much leveling is involved. And uh, time is money. So you want to put the tape on both sides of the fret. That way you don't have any issues with accidentally marring the fretboard when you're doing the work. And I found that it helps to have different thicknesses of tape because you'll see shortly here that, you know, we're doing a lot of overlapping of tape, which is kind of a waste. So if you have different thicknesses of uh, masking tape, it helps out because that way you can go to the thinner type tape as you're getting to the shallower frets, the, the frets with thinner spacing but what I do is I I don't have thinner tape at the moment so I'll just cut the masking tape with a scissor like this 
um, and then use one side there and one side here. And that usually works fine. It's a little bit extra time, but it's okay. We'll get it to work. The key with working on your guitars is really just trying to make do with what you have. You can you can go buy equipment, you can go buy special tools, um, you can spend a lot of money actually, but often you don't really need to do that. You can just work it out with what you have. Most of the tools that you see on places like Stumac and whatnot, these are all things, well, the majority of them you can make yourself. I mean, back in the olden days, there was no Stumac, right? So people who worked on guitars made do with tools that they can find in, in regular hardware stores. Um, so they ground their own files and made their own um, uh, templates and, and whatnot for routing and all that kind of stuff. And you could do the same. So the reason why I want to show you guys how to do this is because uh, A, I've been doing this for a while now, I think I'm getting pretty good at it. Obviously if you don't know what you're doing, you're better off making a professional do it. This is a disclaimer that I always like to point out because you know sometimes people feel that it's simple and then they end up messing their, their guitar up and that's not the goal. The goal is to do a good job and end up with a guitar that actually plays better, not worse, right? So you can see how long this process takes alone, right? I could easily spend 15 minutes or so just, just masking up the neck. Um, but it's a necessary evil. So if you're not sure on how to do this, I figured I'd show you. That way at least you have a better idea as to whether or not this is something you're capable of doing on your own or not. And if you're not comfortable with it, then I would highly recommend you just bite the bullet and send it to somebody that will actually be able to do it and do a good job of it. That way your guitar will be set up beautifully and you won't have any issues. Now, during this process, if you get bored and you're like many other people that I know that are kind of have a, an attention de deficit and you want to just fast forward the video, you can by all means skip to the next section because it is kind of rather boring to watch somebody taping up a fretboard. But I do talk during the process to kind of making make it a, a little bit less boring and I've often gotten uh, many requests over over the last few years actually where people sent me messages saying what I please show them how to how I work on my guitars and how I do certain things so I know that there's a lot of you out there that w would you know, are doing these type of things and would like to have more tips and instruction on how to do a better job. And so I feel that it's my obligation to show you what I know. And by all means, this is not necessarily the only way to do this, right? Everybody has their own method. This is mine. Uh, I know I always get comments as to, you know, people telling me I'm doing it wrong or there's a better way and I know that this is not the only way, okay, but this is the way I do it, so if you have a better way, that's fine, if that works for you, no, no problems, um, but this is how I've done it for many years, and it seems to be doing the job, for me anyway. So as you can see, uh, this is the reason why uh, different size tape would be better, it just saves a bit of time here. Actually, let me put this one here. I like to tape it all the way down, all the way down to the edge. Now, I know that it's a little bit difficult at times to see all the details. I'm setting up the camera here so that um, you have a good view over my shoulder. It's a little hard to get a camera angle properly when you're dealing 
with uh, building guitars and stuff and I moved out of my basement into my garage here so if you hear some funny noises it's just people down the street kids playing or what um, but I figured the garage is a much better place because it tends to be quieter and it tends to have better lighting overhead lighting um, which hopefully will make for a better video at the end of the day alright so we're almost done here we just have two more so masking tape is one of those things that you can never get enough of when you're working on your guitars um, and that especially if you don't want to mar your finish I use masking tape for so many different things um, just to create a protected protective barrier across you know the, the guitar surfaces even when I'm drilling new holes or working on making a repair and I don't want to get you know glue or other things on the finish the masking tape is a must uh, when you're working on guitars like that okay so we're almost done last piece of tape going in now and we'll move to the next section all right so don't worry if the tape slightly covers the frets um, as long as the top of the fret is clear we should be good to go now some people like to remove the nut when they're doing a fret level because when they're passing the actual uh, fret level it sometimes gets in the way I don't usually remove it because I feel like I could control it enough that it's not necessarily an issue for me so I'll show you how I do it that way alright so the next step now is to um, level the frets now because I marked the areas um, where the frets were not level um, this is normally a guide for me to determine whether or not um, I'll do a complete fret level or I'll just focus on one or two frets in this case there's one two three four five six seven frets that need to be leveled so it wouldn't really make sense for me to level individually so I prefer to do a complete fret level at this point so after I identify them what I normally do and after this is completely protected with tape I go ahead and I basically mark the top of all every single fret completely with a sharpie and the reason why you will do this is it is a visual cue as to where you've already achieved a flat surface and I'll explain to you in more detail how that works in a minute so a sharpie does the job it gives you a nice clean dark line try not to get any sharpie on the fretboard I mean in this case we have tape so it won't be an issue But you want to make sure to put a line across every single fret. And um, don't be afraid to make it nice and dark, it'll come off. And it's okay if it covers the other lines we had previously, because those were just as a visual evaluation as a starting point okay so now that we have everything marked up nice and dark you can see that very dark we can put the sharpie away the next thing we, we need as a tool is a fret level and you can buy fret levels you can pay a lot of money for them but I basically created my own and what I do is I take an actual level that you can buy in a hardware store I get one that's not very big a little bit smaller than the fretboard and what I do is I put some two-sided tape on this side and I stick to it some sandpaper and I usually go with a relatively coarse grit this case I believe it's one is it 120 180 grit 180 grit sandpaper and that'll be my leveling tool you want to make sure you have a nice level surface okay um, and this works very very well 
Now you can spend more money, you can get some dedicated tools as well, but I'll show you in a minute that this actually works quite nice. Alright, so now the next thing would be to, for me to show you how I go ahead and, and level it. Now I'm trying to get the, the neck in the shot. Now this is not necessarily the most comfortable angle for me to work at, but I'm going to show you how I go about doing it. So I start off at the edge, and I do a pass. And I'm not putting a lot of pressure on it. I'm basically just guiding the fret level across the frets. Less is more, guys. In this particular case, you don't need to press very hard or go crazy with the back and forth. You want to take off the minimum amount of material but at the same time make sure that all of the sharpie is gone. So you can see that on these frets, if I catch the light, the sharpie is pretty much gone, but there are some frets where the sharpie is not gone yet. So you want to continue that process. Do it at a different angle. until all of the sharpie is gone. Okay. And you'll feel it. You'll feel when it's when you're getting there because you won't feel as many bumps. Okay. So you can see there's still a little high fret here, right here, actually, right here, still a little high fret, a couple of little areas here. So I'm not going to sand the entire neck, I'm going to focus on the lower area for now. still see that it, it's still a little bit low. You can still see a bit of the the sharpie there. So that's the stubborn fret right there. A little more. And although it seems like we're taking off a lot of material, we're actually not. Because I'm not pressing very hard. So what I, this process basically allows you to level the frets in, this, in the sense that if that's a low fret, it'll take off more meat from the other frets till they're at the same height as the, as the low fret. And I'll just keep going till the top of the fret is been touched by the sandpaper. In this case, we're pretty much done. And there's just a little section up here. And we're good to go. All right. And what I do before I actually put the fret level away is that I, I do another pass with the fret rocker just to make sure that we still don't have issues so it's the same type of deal that we did before we want to make sure that we didn't create any new issues and that the issues we had before are gone now if you remember we had one here and that one's fine so nothing is rocking back and forth now so we're good. That's what you want. Uh, let me take this side here. Now I'm working on a towel here guys and it's better to work on a, a more rigid surface but I use a towel so I don't 
scratch the guitars and stuff. So far so good guys, we don't have any more rocking happening on the frets, so that's good. Good. And that's what you want. I mean, it takes a little bit of extra time to check all your frets, but it's worthwhile because if you put the, the neck back on the guitar only to discover that you still have a high fret somewhere, it's a, it's a pain. So you have to take everything off again. You don't want to do that. Okay, uh, we're good to go. All right, so I can verify now that everything is level. So now we've damaged the frets. The frets, you know, obviously are rough now. They're not rounded over the top anymore. So the next step in the process would be to recrown the frets and make them round again. And typically to do that, you need a special tool. That's one of those tools that is very hard to make. So what I usually use, I have a couple of different tools, but I find this one works pretty nicely. This is something that I purchased from Stumac. It's a uh, fret file. And it's a fret file that has um, two different um, types of fret curves in it. So a wider one for wider frets and a narrow, narrower one for narrow frets. Now I also have a diamond file that I like to use sometimes. Uh, but in this case, this one will work fine. I'm going to go with this one. Um, if I find that it's leaving too much chatter, I'll switch to my diamond file. And in this case, because the frets are not fat frets, I'm using the narrower, narrower uh, side of the two. So, um, what I like to do is I just take the fret file and go back and forth on the fret. And the idea here is to make the fret round again, but you don't want to go too crazy, and it's okay to see just a little sliver of, um, of flat fret on the top, like a very thin edge. And you don't need, doesn't take much time, a couple of passes, and your, your fret will be round again. You'll see the, the chatter marks from the, from the sandpaper will disappear. It'll still be rough, but we're not done. The process is not finished. And you want to make sure that you get all of the frets. And sometimes you have to focus on the edge of the frets a little more because the frets are rounded, they're curved, you have to follow the curve as you're filing to make sure you catch all of the points. And you know, you gotta, you gotta be diligent and you have to have decent eyesight to make sure that you're not overlooking any little areas. You'll feel it with your fingernail. You know, if the fret is rough and you pass your fingernail, you'll feel any divot. And that's what you don't want to feel. At the end of this process, you want your frets to feel like glass, basically. And they will. I'll show you exactly how to do that. All right. So you can see it doesn't take much time at all at this stage of the game. Steady does it. Um, again, not too much pressure. And a couple of strokes, you're done. Right. So I slowly round over the edge. To give it back its round shape because it, 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 it'll have, see this one has a little bit of a 
needs a little bit more love. And this is where good lighting comes in. This one too here. That's a little bit of a section that I missed. And that's how it works. This gives you plenty of time to think about your next project, which guitars you got to work on next. Think about life. Think about what you want to do with your day. How great the guitar will feel when it's set up properly and ready to play. Okay, so yeah, we're getting there. Very nice, very nice. So far, so good. Now when you're dealing with stainless steel frets, these are not stainless, by the way. These are nickel. But if you have a guitar that has stainless steel frets, it's actually quite a bit more work to work on stainless. Stainless is a much harder material. That's why it's considered premium, because it makes the frets last long. And uh, the softer the material, the quicker you can get it to shape the way you want, but the quicker they'll also lose their shape. I like uh, nickel frets. I find the nickel frets for me work fine uh, because I have quite a few guitars and I don't play one exclusively. Uh, they t the frets tend to last for me. And I normally, you know, do fret levels pretty regularly when it's required. So I, I don't get too many divots in my frets. Sometimes you will see divots appear on your frets when you're when you've played a guitar for a long time, especially, you know, also up here, they tend to pop up. And those typically don't become a big issue until they become rather deep. But you want to take care of your fretboard before an issue becomes major. And learning how to do this will give your fretboard lots of life and playing time. There we go. So a good fret file is super important. And I've had this one for a while now. I'm probably going to have to upgrade or renew it because after a while they do become used up. Uh, you don't want to use a regular file for this. It has to be rounded. The last thing you want to do is use a regular file. Okay. So I don't know how long we've been working on this, guys. This is real time. I haven't been stopping the video or anything. So this is how long it takes, you know. And if your time is worth money, you might, again, send it to a professional that is already set up and can do it rather quickly. But if you have the time and you have the inclination to learn, it'll save you a lot of money down the line, especially if you have a lot of guitars like I do. If I had to bring all my guitars to a tech every time there was an issue, I'd be in the poorhouse. I'd rather spend my time fixing my own guitars and put the money that I'm saving towards other guitars. It's a win-win situation in that case, for me anyway. So we got one, two, three, four frets to go, guys. If you want to fast forward at this point, you can. It's the same process over and over again. One thing I want to say, at this point, I'm not rounding over the edges of the frets on this side. 
if you have fret sprout, and what spread, fret sprout is, is when you run your fingers up the side of the neck and you feel very sharp edges protruding. Now fret sprout is usually caused by changes in humidity within the wood because wood contracts and shrinks depending on the amount of water in the air, how much humid, how much humidity is in your space. Usually you'll notice that in the winter time when you're heating your house or in the summertime. Usually when it's humid it'll uh, it'll expand, when it's dry it'll shrink. So you usually will notice your fret sprout happening in the winter if you're heating up or if you live in particularly dry climates in the summertime. Um, where I am it's usually humid in the summer. So yeah, I don't really notice too much in the summer but in the winter is when it becomes quite dry. Okay. So if you do notice fret sprout, it's a good time to take care of it when you're doing your fret leveling because you will be already, you know, you'll have your neck masked up already and it's not a, a, a time intensive process like this is. You can actually do it quite quickly. One day I'll show you guys how I do that as well. If, uh, I have to fix uh, one of my guitars that has an issue with fret sprout, but this one luckily does not. So I'm looking this over here. I'll just take a, another peek. If there's any areas that need a slightly more attention, a little, a little touch up, I'll do that now. There's not many areas that I've missed. But we're not done guys. This is not the entire process. I wish it was, but it isn't. There's, a, there's more steps involved. But I'm happy with what we have so far. I think, uh, you know, when you catch the light, you can see the frets are pretty nice now. And you can see the marks that I've made on the tape. And this is why we want to tape up the fretboard. Okay. All right. So the next step involves uh, different grits of sandpaper and I have some grits at my disposal here uh, not all of the ones I need unfortunately but I'm going to use some of the grits that I already have so this is 2000 grit we're gonna put that aside I usually keep my sandpaper uh, bits available uh, this is more 2000 grit uh, this if, um, if you don't know what it is, don't use it, because it's very important to use the proper grits at the proper time. So what I do is I have quite a few different pieces of sandpaper here, and it goes up to 3,000 grits. So I have 2,000, 2,500, um, all the way, this is I think 6,000 grit, which is a little bit too much for what we need. Uh, but I'm going to look at what we have here. If the sandpaper grits are too used up, I won't use them again. But you can usually get one or two uh, fret levels out of a piece of sandpaper before you have to throw that away. So what I'll do here, I'll tell you at the grits that I start at. So 240 is too abrasive. So what I need here, I usually start at about 600 and work my way up. So I have 400, I have 1500, we'll need that. So 400 is not, um, it's too thick. So I'll go through my grits, actually I'll flip them over this way. So 20, so we have 15, 2000, 2500, and I'll go down my grits here. until I can find the ones that I need. Um, it's good to have plenty of, uh, of sandpaper because you will need it. You don't need a lot, but you will need it. So this is 800 grit, this is 1000 grit, and let's see if I have some 600 here. Uh, I might not have 600 in this pack. Let's just see here. 400. 
Unfortunately, I don't have six. So I have four, but not six. And I have eight. So I can... Oh, we do have six. Here we go. Perfect. All right. So we have what we need. Put the rest of the sandpaper away. We don't need all this. And all right, so at this point, we'll take the 600 grit sandpaper. This is six, and what I what I like to do is I actually I cut myself a little piece of 600 grit sandpaper. You don't need a lot. There's no point in using all of this. Um, I usually cut a piece about yay big, and what I do is I write it on the back because. If you if it's not indicated, you won't know what it is. All right, so we'll start with the six. And what I do, a lot of people do this different ways. What I do is I wrap the sandpaper around my fingers like this. Hold it with my in between. You can do it this way too. You can hold it like this. You can hold it like this. And I just put it down and I pass it back and forth. Okay, you just if it if it slips out, you just hold it back again. Now you see how quickly I'm doing this. It doesn't take much time to do this. I'll do a couple of passes. Just make sure you you hit all of the threads. And that's the first pass. Now you'll, the frets will typically look dull, but we're going to bring it back to a shine gradually. What we're typically doing is we're taking out the scratches one step at a time. So that's all we need to do with the 600. I'll take the 800. This is eight. Do the same thing. Cut a piece. The piece is maybe an inch and a half. Uh, an inch and a half by the length of the... Um, sandpaper, mark it down, because so I'll get a couple of uses out of it. Do the same thing and do it again. Now some people like to do it this way, okay, because they feel that if we're making scratches this way you'll feel it more, but I'll show you why I do it this way, because we're not finished. There's a magic step that I do towards the end that'll make it all make sense to you guys, alright? Alright, so that was 800, now we're going to go to 1000. If you have in between grits, by all means use them. Um, sometimes in between grits of certain um, gauge, um, uh, just you know, aggressiveness are hard to find. So if you can find all of the ones in between, the more steps you take, the better results you'll get at the end. And slowly you'll see the, the sparkle come back. And I focus on the edge too of the frets. It gives it, it gives it that round, that played in feel. Okay? So you can see how much use I'm getting out of the, the piece. Like I can use this again. So no point throwing things out right away. So that's 1000, this is 1005. So we'll do the same thing with 1,005, 1,500, and at this point, not very rough at all, but it, it does make a difference. You don't want to skip a step. Now 
And this is why, again, we're using tape. Because if you had to do all of this with a little uh, fret protector, it would take you way, way, way more time. I'm going, at this point, pretty fast. All right. And already, if I run my nail across it, it's not super smooth, but it's way smoother than it was. By the time we're finished, it'll feel like glass, okay? 2000 grit, same process. Now the idea here is that the scratches in, in the frets become smaller and smaller and finer and finer uh, and become easier to buff out. Now the, we're going to get to 2500 here. Because your fingers are meaty, the sandpaper does go around the fret quite a bit. So it's not just touching the top of the fret, it's actually going around the sides as well. Okay, now you can see how dirty the front of the fretboard is, is getting. Um, now I thought I had 3000 grid here. Um, should we stop at 2500 or should we go up to do I have a 3000 grit here? I thought I did. Maybe I didn't. So. No, I do have a 3000 grit right here. So 3000 grit is usually where I stop. And it's a good idea to keep all of your sandpaper in a Ziploc because you get more wear and tear out of it, lasts longer, costs less in the long run. If you have to constantly buy new every time, it gets pretty expensive. As I said, you can get a couple of fret levels out of a piece of um, a piece of uh, sandpaper like this. There we go. There we go. And alrighty. So, getting there. All right, next step. This is where the magic happens, guys. Okay, and usually people will continue with sandpaper. Uh, at this point, they'll move to, uh, they'll perhaps move to polish compound. You can do it that way, um, scratch remover. But I found something that works uh, better. And I'll share that with you guys. It is a messy process. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put down a little bit of a protective um, piece of paper here. Because for the next step, it, it tends to get a little bit messy. So if you have a piece of paper, piece of cardboard, whatever, put that down. 
I'll actually move my guitar body out of here because I don't want it to get uh, dirty. Next step in the process, I actually go to a Dremel. Something like this. And you want to use the Dremel, but you don't want to use the aggressive tip, the sanding tip. What you want to use is a buff buffer tip. And what I tend to use are these. You can get these off of um, eBay. You can get these off of Amazon. They're basically mini buffing buffer wheels. Um, and this works like a charm. I'll show you how we do that. So we'll put that in here. The secret to all of this is this. In this box is what we call Jewelers Rouge. Rouge is, this is kind of like a clay. It's actually a compound that you can use. It's made uh, in China. You can get this from Woodstock International Inc. It's called, uh, it's buffing uh, buffer compound. And this will make your frets sparkle. All right. So I'll, I'll show you how this works. It's a little messy and it's going to get a little noisy. You could easily burn through the tape and go through the finish. When I do this, I tend to use the fret protector. That way I make sure I'm not burning through the tape and I'm not burning through, more importantly, the finish. These fret protectors usually come in two sizes, a narrow one and a thicker one. So I use the thicker one for the upper frets and the narrow one for the lower frets. All right, so I, I will use this. To use this and put the actual paste on your Dremel, because it is rather hard, it feels like a hard clay, uh, you have to run it into it while it's working. I usually cover it up with my hand because it goes everywhere. Okay. Now you don't need much, but you'll see how nicely it works. Okay. So let's go to it. I'll do the first one. At first, your fret will look dark. If you speed it up a little bit, that'll come off and it's going to get uh, super shiny. So I'm going to put it a little bit higher up here, but about three, and we're going to continue. So, just so you can see what just a couple of seconds has done compared to the other fret, look how much shinier this fret is here. Like this fret now feels like glass. And we're going to do that same process to all the frets. Now, when you see the frets uh, taking a little longer, you can add a little bit more of the Jewelers Rouge and continue the rest. This is the same stuff that Jewelers use to uh, put the shine back in rings and jewelry and gold and all that kind of stuff. There's, it comes in different uh, grits, but the red one seems to work best. You want to try not to get your finger as you're going through because it will, it will burn your finger. Um, and let me just put a little bit more. A 
as you can see guys I mean I didn't take too long and I have a beautiful mirror finish on my frets now you can spend more time you can go you know spend way more time polishing if you wish and even bring it into you know a really super shine which you know I might, I might do but already this is beautiful this beautiful beautiful frets um, you won't feel any chatter and it's wonderful so once you're at that stage of the of the game unless you want to continue and go further um, all you really have to do is remove the tape and uh, install the neck on your guitar adjust the truss rod install some strings obviously I can't do that yet because I don't have any tuners on it that'll be the next step but the frets for all intents and purposes are done this is where the piece of tape comes in handy along the sides normally you would have to peel off every single one like this one at a time you would have to take this and peel them off one at a time which is time consuming and frankly not the smart way of working because I put the tape all along the edge here if you just peel the tape like this it takes all of the other pieces of tape that we have on the fretboard along with it and you can basically peel off everything way quicker just like this. And again, time is money, so why waste time? And there we go, guys. That's how I go about leveling and polishing my fretboard. So hopefully this video gave you the inspiration and the courage to try it yourself. As I always say, if you're not really 100% certain that you can actually work on your guitar yourself and not ruin it, then I would highly recommend that you bring it to a guitar tech or luthier to do the work for you. But if you have done work on your guitar and you are confident that you have the skills required to do this process for yourself, then it is a great uh, technique to learn because it will save you not only time and money in the long run, it will also make your guitars a heck of a lot more enjoyable to play. And like I said at the beginning of the video, nothing beats smooth level frets. So that's it for today, guys. I hope you enjoy this video. If you do like what I'm showing on my workbench when I work on my guitars and you want to see more of these type of videos on the channel, please comment below. I'll be happy to take you along with me while I'm working on my guitars. There's a heck of a lot to learn and a lot of different aspects of guitar maintenance and care that I can share with you. So if you're interested in seeing those videos, please leave a comment and let me know. If you enjoy this type of content, give me a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel because ultimately that is why we are here. That's it for now, guys. Thank you for watching another edition of Addicted to Gear. Take care and see you soon.